Thank you for tuning into Balance Black Girl. My name is Les. I am your host. I appreciate you tapping in. And it's a fun day because I'm coming at you with a bonus episode. If you listen to the show, you know we usually come out with episodes on Tuesdays. This week we have a treat. We have a bonus episode coming at you Friday. And we're going to talk about something that is very pillar to wellness, and that is nutrition. So I am very excited to sit down with our amazing guest today, Vanessa Rosetto, who is a registered dietitian. She is also the CEO of Kalina Health. We're going to do a little nutrition myth busting and simplify it for all of us because we get so much conflicting information about nutrition that makes it more complicated than it needs to be. So Vanessa, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. So fun. I'm so excited to have you. Nutrition is something I nerd out about and love talking about. Nice. And we have a lot to get into today. Yeah, hit me with it. I'm ready. Perfect. Okay. So first off, you are a career change dietitian. Yes. Can you tell us more about what you were doing before and what made you become an RD? I literally don't know what I was doing before. I I mean, (laughs) I I make this joke all the time, but I'm my parents' biggest disappointment because I'm not a doctor and they're immigrants. So I like, I went to college. I majored in history because I wanted in my mind, what I thought was going to be like the easiest major to get the best GPA. It actually wasn't that easy. Um, And I thought maybe I was going to go to law school and then I was working in media and sales. I got a master's in marketing. I was just sort of like trying to find my way, but I was always very interested in medicine and nutrition. And in college, like backstory is that my mother, I guess, for all intents and purposes, is like living in a larger body my whole life. I never had a scale. I was always pretty thin. I didn't know anything about food. I got to college and I gained 50 pounds and I like, graduated from college and I lost 50 pounds live, go, moving back home, living in my parents' house. So I like understood that I must have been overeating processed food, right? I was in the Bronx in the 90s. So here we are. I was eating like White Castle and Sparrow, which was delicious. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then I was like, oh, I should go to a dietitian and I should like learn about this. And so I went to a dietitian. Her name is Carrie Glassman. She's very well known, just a good friend of mine. And she explained everything to me in this very pragmatic way, right? It was just like, if you want weight loss, you do this. But she wasn't like, you can't eat rice and beans, which I eat every day because I'm Haitian. You can't do, like, she was like, this is just how you would do it. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And then I asked her more about her profession and it was medicine adjacent. So I was like, oh, I think I'm going to try to do this. So I just applied and I got in and the rest is history. Very cool. Yeah. 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 And when you say medicine adjacent, I do think that that may be why people don't realize that everyday people can work with dietitians because my first introduction to dietitians would be in hospitals. Like I had, you know, my grandmothers both had a lot of health issues. I had one grandmother who was, you know, a diabetic, had heart issues. So there were always dietitians kind of coming in and out of her care and what she was doing. And I think that may be what a lot of people associate with it. But with Kalina, what you're doing is making working with dietitians accessible for everyday people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, All of the dietitians are trained in New York City hospitals, which I think is very cool and very important because we understand how to be part of that interdisciplinary team. We know how to work with doctors and we understand the patient from a medical lens first. And then the medical nutrition therapy is like layered on top and being trained in New York City hospitals. If you know anything, they are in the community. So the placement of them are usually like across the street from a housing project. However, medicine is always happening in New York City. So celebrities are coming, you know, I have princes have been my patients. Like I've had like all (laughs) all in all. Right. And so people don't realize that the dietitian does more than just like a low sodium diet education. Right. And so I think that is what is really interesting. And the thing for the dietitian is that when you're in house, you only see a patient for like 15 minutes and then maybe they're there tomorrow. Maybe they're not. So you don't get like impact for the five years that I worked at Mount Sinai hospital, only one patient ever came back. And she was like, Hey, you, you were the dietitian that I had, you know, three years ago. And I remember everything that you did. And I was like, Oh, wow, that, that feels so good to be able to see you. So Kulina is allowing us to really make that connection with that patient and see them like long term and help them get that outcome while coordinating the care with their physician. And also it's free because your insurance will pay for it. That's interesting. Okay, can we talk more about that? Because I don't I don't think people know that. I didn't know that. People don't know that. Yeah. So like in 2008 with Obamacare, it was the first time that nutrition was written into 
the plans. And so Medicare, Medicaid said, okay, we're going to cover nutrition. And then commercial payers were like, hey, we will double down on that and we'll give more. So it's an ed- this education piece. But also, I think the thing that we should also talk about is that nutrition always feels like it's like for the elite, right? In like 2014, the New York Times did an article on a dietitian that we will not name because who knows if we say her name, what will happen to us. But uh, <laughs> she was charging a thousand dollars a session. And so if you are just a regular person, you're like, oh, that's not for me. Right. That is just for like people who own hedge funds. And like, you know, we call them like Wall Street girls. Like th- those are these people like we, we cannot ever access that. Yeah. And we were working at Mount Sinai Hospital then being like, she doesn't know anything more than us. How can she possibly charge this money? But it also was like, a crazy thing to com- like to compartmentalize because you're like, oh, wait, but I also have value. So like, where can I insert myself? And so I just like went on this journey and was like, hey, I'm going to take insurance. I'm going to get on all the insurance panels. And if people want to see me, they can. And if they don't, I don't care because I always had another job. And then that's how Kulina kind of came to be. How it was born. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have another question about the insurance thing. Mm-hmm. Is it kind of like therapy where you need a diagnosis for it to be covered or anybody can get nutrition coverage? Anybody can get nutrition coverage. It's, it is plan dependent. So it just depends on what your employer, it's usually like, you know, fully funded by the employer, Mm -hmm. what the employer has decided, but you and I can work at the same place. And we've had this experience before where like you have the higher plan. So all of your visits for nutrition are covered Mm -hmm. and I have a different plan and maybe I only get three or I get none at all. So you will have to do a little bit of homework to see what is the offering that your employer is giving you. But 91% of our patients exercise their insurance benefit. And, you know, they are getting 12 sessions, pretty much minimum. Some of them, there are nuances where they'll only do three or six or one per calendar year, but that's not the norm. Very cool. Yeah. That's covered in that way. Mm -hmm. 91%. That's amazing. Yep. Yeah. 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 And last month we did 3,400 sessions. Wow. We have 9,000 active patients. Wow. Yeah. So that's incredible. Yeah. 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 It's good. So can we talk about the Kalina origin story and how it came to be? Yeah. Uh, Tamar, our other co-founder, uh, I, I was working at NYU as a dietetic internship director and someone was asking about, um, a functional medicine dietitian, somebody who knew a lot about supplements. And I knew that Tamar, was in that world. She had been my student previously. So I messaged her and we met for a coffee and she was like, Hey, we should start a private practice together. And I was like, okay, sure. So we just hired two other RDs and made them W2 employees. And we were just going to take insurance, pay them and at the end of the year, pay our taxes and split whatever was left. And then COVID happened. And it was the first time that a telemedicine visit was being reimbursed the same rate. And as an in-office visit. And so we made a million dollars in less than a year with no marketing. That had never happened wow. with regards to a private practice for nutrition. And then VCs started calling. So venture capitalists started calling and they were like, hey, do you want funding? And I was like, hmm, I should try this. And then, then these VCs were like, you'll never get a payer to fund you. And I was like, hmm. But we did. So Blue Cross Blue Shield is one of our largest <laughs> investors. We're very close to them. Yeah. And then that just that flywheel just like turned on. And so now we have like 80 plus dietitians. We have 100 employees. I don't know. It's like it's very crazy that this is my life right now. <laughs> I just was like, oh, it's just gonna be like a side hustle. I'll work my job at the university and I will have this extra. And then it morphed into this, which feels good because we are really helping people. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think. I am also a business VC nerd in yeah. addition to being a wellness I'll nerd. I'll give it so to you, girl. I think it's so, so fascinating, but also really cool to see a black woman led business be able to raise these venture capital dollars to have something that is very mission driven, because I think a lot of our businesses tend to be consumer product based. And there's nothing wrong with consumer product based because that solves problems that we have that other people don't. But it is really cool to see something that is more mission driven, health aligned, be able to reach that level. Yeah. And that like what you just said is true, that that is really important to me. And it's what I have noticed. So people who say they want to invest in black women, they don't really want to do that. Right. Black women get women get 2% of VC dollars. Black women get less. Uh, only a hundred black women have ever raised a million dollars uh, in venture. I'm one of them at, at the end of this raise, it'll be like over 25 million. It is very brutal out there. It's very market dependent. It's like the intersectionality of race. Like 
white men rule the world. They see black men in the locker room. They see white women in the living room and they don't necessarily see black women. So it is it is a climb, but somehow we have these like really great investors, white, black, we all, you know, all, all in between who really believe in us. We're doing good work. Um, and it's not, you know, like hair care and body butter. And like, you know, I know healthcare. I know it really well. I'm trained by really smart people and, and they believe in me. And so I think that sort of like filters through and, and has helped us get this far. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm sure opens doors for, for future black women. Yeah. I mean, when this is over, I'm like, am I going to raise a fund? Or am I gonna, am I going to go work? Well, I'm going to go work for a fund. Oh, I have like okay. all of my investors. I'm like, hi, I'm going to come work for somebody. They're like, yeah, you can come work for us because I am very interested in how can you deploy capital for real to founders that are really doing good work and then like get in the shit with them. Yes. Right. Cause a lot of times like these investors, it's amazing, but they're not operators. So they don't know what the day to day is to run a business. And so everything is just like a theory and a pontification and it's sometimes it's not very helpful. So just like getting in there and helping somebody just get over the hill would be like the most amazing thing, I think. Okay, we got to talk because that's what I want to do. Eventually. Oh, so we'll chat offline. In. Yeah, dude, let's do <laughs> We'll it. go find some funds. Yeah, together. yeah. The funds are there, man. The funds are there. We can do it. It's just not in this market. This market is very ugly, but it's, it's, a, it's a weird time, but it'll come back. Yeah, it'll come back. It'll come back. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So let's get into some nutrition mm -hmm. myth busting. Mm -hmm. Because I think what's been really interesting, particularly over the past decade with social media, is just the amount of information out there yeah. about nutrition, about wellness, about this and about that. And what tends to be very sexy and what tends to sell are these declarations of absolute truth. Yeah. But that's kind of not a real thing. Like, no. There's no such thing as a declaration of absolute truth. No when it comes to health that's and right. well-being. That's right, because we're all different. So right. It doesn't really <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. like we're all different. Something, you know, maybe a particular style of eating diet may work for a particular amount of time for what it was intended to, but that doesn't mean everybody needs to do it the same way for forever. That's right, that's right. I mean, I, first of all, I've said this before, I'm, and I think you heard me say this the other day, which is the way that we do nutrition studies is bullshit. It's not randomized control. So, hey guys, surprise. It, whatever works for you might work for you and might not work for the other person. And we don't really know because we are doing food frequency questionnaires. We're actually trying to rely on someone's memory. You can't remember what you did from when you came in 20 minutes ago. Right. You just can't. Let's, so like, let's level set there. And then there's this whole, like, if you eat the chia seed mango cookie and like you vilify the seed oils and like, it's like, no, that's not right. Also in America, people don't really understand how to read studies. They don't understand research. How many, so many people come to me and they're like, I read this study N of three. And I'm like, that's not statistically significant. So like everybody <laughs> really calm down. <laughs> like, it's just like, we don't actually know the answers. We're doing the best that we can, but there are some things that are true, right? Like, so eating processed foods are, it's okay, but you can't eat it all the time. That's not an attack. That's not right. Like that's not me telling you that you can't have them or that you are less than because you have them, but let's call a spade a spade. Like stuff has chemicals in it. So probably isn't the best thing. It's like if you drink soda every single day and I was like, don't drink the soda every single day, that's not good for you. You wouldn't feel some kind of way. But if I told you not to eat the Doritos and by the way, if anyone has ever heard me, you know that I would never tell you not to eat the Doritos <laughs> because I eat them every day, actually. Uh, they are made in a certain way. Perfectly, I think. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, like this is what this is what it is. So we we do have to start telling people the truth. And the truth is it is very nuanced. It is very specific. What you eat does matter. Sometimes what you weigh does matter. Sometimes it does. OK, can we talk about that? Uh -huh. Because I so I don't tend to talk about weight a lot on this show because I want it to be a very body neutral space. Sure. And I, I would love to talk about the difference between instances where maybe somebody has something like a metabolic disorder where weight is impacted and it is a health issue versus sometimes some people just have larger bodies and their health concerns are not taken seriously because they happen to be in a larger body. As a care provider, how do you differentiate? Yeah. So when someone comes in, right, and they, they're they like, okay, I've 
I've been this way. Usually people come in and they're like, I want to lose weight. And maybe let's say they're like 210 pounds. And you're like, okay, fine. And it's like, I want to be 140 pounds. And you're like, have you ever been 140 pounds in your life? No. What does your family look like? Everyone's in larger bodies. What's the lowest weight you've ever been in five years? 185. Okay. Were you like dieting or was that just like a natural thing? No, it was a natural thing. Okay. That's probably where you live and that's fine. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like, let's change some habits and let's see if we get you there. And then we get you there and that's fine. And so you're still in a larger body, but you're not at this place where you were, you didn't have these habits that were really serving you. Right. That's like a very different um, presentation when you, when someone says that, right. Like it's totally fine where you're eating pizza every single night. You're drinking a ton of alcohol. You're eating lots of sweets. You don't move your body. You don't like water. Like we have something to talk about. Right. And then, and your weight is up. You can do whatever you want. You're an adult, but this is probably not going to end very well for you. So that's where like those nuances are. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, when you think about, I I, I've been thinking about this a lot because I I got cancer last year. Mm -hmm. I, my weight is fine and stable. I did lose 30 pounds because I had anxiety, not because of the cancer and all of my lab values that had been elevated. But the doctor was like, there's nothing wrong with you, right? Like you, like you're fine. Your weight is fine. It's like maybe on the higher side, but it's all fine. Mm -hmm. And there, you know what to do. You're a dietitian, like send you on your way. And then I lost this 30 pounds and then my lab values went down and I'm like, huh, that weight mattered. Hmm. And then I don't have any unknown variants and I don't have I don't have BRCA1 and 2. And I'm like, I wonder if my weight mattered in like some cascade. I, we will never know. And, and I won't I'm not going to go there, but it's something to think about. Right. And that's a, that might be my story, but that's not your story or somebody else's story. And so that's why when somebody comes to you and they present, we have to do like real extensive intake and dialogue and understanding the person's day to day. So when you come to see us, we take this extensive intake and then we have a conversation, get the voiceover. Then it's like two weeks of us just like watching what you do and how you do it so that we can really understand. Is this person doing everything great? And like they're really small tweaks. And so they are likely on the best path or like, can we make adjustments here and make things better? That's that's where there's that like in between. And so when people are like, there's no benefit in food tracking, there's no benefit in labs. There's no, it's like, that's not true because that's the data that's going to help us get a better outcome. Right. Right. And it's, it's about making as informed of a decision as you can, but you can't really make an informed decision if you don't have any data. Right. And the thing is, is that if somebody has disordered eating, eating disorders, we, we treat them in a different way. We can identify that very quickly and we treat them in a different way. But if somebody is really looking for the data to make them better so that they can live longer, be happier, lower their cardiac labs, like then that is our job to help them do that. Right. Right. And to help people understand what those numbers Mm -hmm. mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody needs to walk you through. Like when someone's like, oh, my doctor told me that my LDL doesn't matter. I'm like, no, that's the largest predictor of stroke and heart attack that we have. It does matter. (laughs) Let me walk you through that. (laughs) But to your point, people in larger bodies get those stories, right? It's like, oh, well, my doctor told me there's nothing I can do. And, you know, I need to be on a drug and it doesn't really matter that much. And it's like, okay, well, why don't we present it like, hey, let's try something for three months. And if that doesn't work, then you know you gave it your your all and you can feel okay about going on that statin because it's not going to change because it is familial, X, Y, and Z, right? And so just telling people those things or even telling people like, hey, everyone in your family is in a larger body and you've been this weight your whole life. So it's likely not going to change because 5,000 genes inform our our weight. And they're like, wow. I, had a, I had a patient once be like, you've literally just changed my life. I was like, yeah. Yeah. So let's just focus on some habits and see what we can get from that. She was like, I, you just took away like years of shame and guilt. I was like, I'm so happy I could help you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's why that knowledge is power. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because, and that's the other thing and why I tread very carefully having a wellness platform with how I talk about weight mm-hmm. and something that frustrates me a lot with conversations about weight is it's treated almost like this moral thing and it's not it's not it's that's just so 
awful. A lot of that messaging particularly goes towards women. A lot of health concerns that we have get dismissed because of maybe how our bodies look or what the shape of our bodies is. And it's just, it's so frustrating. It's infuriating. It's like, you know, everyone's like food is medicine. Like it's some sort of like new thing. And I'm like, guys, food is medicine. What a dietitian does for their job. Second of all, I don't like this food is medicine because if I'm poor and I only have $20 a week to eat food and I don't have access to organic anything, then I'm not eating good medicine. And so I'm going to be sick. Like that isn't how we lead. Right. It's more of like, hey, what do you have access to? What's your functionality? What's your health literacy? And let me make this work for you. So you can get yogurt and nuts and water at a bodega. So you, you, you gonna be all right. Like it's, there's fruit there. There are things, right? Like you can get frozen vegetables at the dollar store. You don't have to eat every single thing organic. It, it doesn't have to be all vegan. Like you, we can figure this out, but like, let's take that shame away. Let's stop talking about this in absolute terms. And if you don't do this, you're, you're doomed. Right. It's not how it works. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I would also love to get into some kind of nutrition trends, which is so weird to even have those two words together. Yeah, the yeah, fact yeah. That it's trendy. Food that we eat is trendy. It's trendy, but it is. Yeah, yeah. It, it really is. Yeah. The first one I would love to talk about, and I, I have participated in this. I will admit. Oh, tell me the protein. The girlies are. <gasps> oh yeah. Are it's because we the protein. You know, it's the bodybuilders. I used to, my best friend is Robin. Uh, we've been best friends for 30 years. And Robin and I are two moms that used to work out at a powerlifting gym in Northern New Jersey. We were the only like non-competing people there. And we could lift and deadlift and do all the things. And we would watch these bodybuilders. And we learned a lot of things from them that, that was very interesting, right? Like 15 grams of like really shitty carbohydrate after a lift helps for the uptake of insulin into the cells and like, you know, spares protein, all the things. But these guys, their job is their body and they are consuming massive amounts of protein because they are literally lifting. I mean, it's an hour of just squats, right? Right. Right. So there and then the regular person who's like on the gram is like, oh, this person's body is so amazing and I'm going to do exactly what they're doing. It's like, that's not for you. You you were on a spin class for 45 minutes. You can have water. Stop it. <laughs> Everybody stop. So the recommendation. <laughs> also, I've heard this a pound of. Uh, uh, an ounce of protein for every pound of weight or something I've been hearing. Yeah, a, a lot of people are doing like one gram of protein per pound of protein. Oh, yeah, that's it, right. So like you right. weigh, you know, yeah. 150 pounds. You get 150, 150 yeah, no, whatever. that's wrong, guys. It is, it's <laughs> 0.8 to one times your weight in kilograms. So if you are, you know, your weight is like, if you're 150 pounds, you divide that by 2.2. So that'd give you like 68 grams 68 kilograms times one that would give you 60 like that's 68 grams right and then four ounces of chicken is like 31 grams of protein so you're all okay you don't need to i mean and yes if you're exercising a lot you can go up to like 1.2 grams maybe 1.5 maybe but the most of you are not exercising it a lot I'm sorry if that makes you mad, but it's true. You are <laughs> not to bodybuilder level. Yeah. Yeah. Like you're just not doing it. Like, yeah. y yes, you're walking every day. That's wonderful. But y'all, if you walk every day, five miles every day, then your body is used to that. You don't get anything extra. Sorry that I just did that to you, but it's true. <laughs> don't slide into my DMs. I don't care. <laughs> uh, if you, you know, you do like your 45 minute class, like that's walk. great. And you yeah. lifted like, yeah. great. I'm, it's good. Mm -hmm. This is all great stuff, but you don't need anything extra. You, we just think that we need more than we do because we've been told a lie by all the trends. Right. Yeah. Right. And it just makes things more complicated and than unsustainable. it actually is. You cannot yeah. sustain it. You start to feel stressed out because yeah. you're like, oh, how am I going to get all of this protein in? Or how am I going to get all these carbs in? That's why I don't like I don't fuck with car with uh, macros that much because you'll be like, you need 160 grams of carbs. And that makes people freaked out because we're still traumatized by the Atkins diet. And so then at the end of the day, they have 98 grams of carbs left and they're like, great, I'm just gonna eat a sleeve of Oreo cookies. It just doesn't work. So presenting it in that way is for a specific brain and it's not many people. Yeah. And that specific brain kind of back to the bodybuilding powerlifting example, particularly with bodybuilding, 
For those people, their goal is to build as much muscle as possible by any means necessary. That's right. They're not necessarily they're not eating for joy. They're not eating for joy. They're, they're not know. necessarily eating to like fuel their body to run well nope. or functional movement. Nope. Like to be to have a healthy heart, good nope. cardio. It is purely as much muscle as possible. Yep. They're usually tired. Yeah. Their their joints hurt. Yeah. They are can't really move well because they don't so move well. It's muscle. like really intense. And it's just like, do you and, and then you like talk to them, right? Like this one guy that I knew, he was so funny. He'd be like, I have one cheat meal a year. I'm like, I don't even know what you just said. What's that's, so what, sad. that's so sad. How is this a possibility? Yeah. <laughs> like you don't you don't eat cookies ever? He's like, never. I'm like, huh? I'm like, what about pizza? Like, it's Friday. Are we gonna have pizza? He's like, no, I don't do that. I'm like, your life is really depressing. You just are in this gym all day because you're chasing something. But okay. Yeah. And for most of us, it's like we just kind of want enough energy to get through the day. We want to feel good. We want to be able to move well. We want to be able to, you know, play with our kids. Yeah. We want to feel good. Yeah. That That's the main thing. Like, I want to feel good. I don't want to feel old. I don't want to feel sluggish. I want to have energy. That's it. A lot of, that's a lot of people. I'm much older than you. A lot of people now my age, they'll be like, hey, Vanessa, can you just tell me how to eat for energy? I'm like, yes, I can. I can. Let's stop with drinking every night before I go to before you go to bed. They're like, yes, that part. I'm like, yep, that's gonna help you. But that's what people want. Yeah. It's I don't know. I think we're like off the trend of like, let's all be very, very skinny. No one cares, I don't think, that much. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I hope so. I mean, funny enough, what you just said, that was literally what started my whole wellness journey was I had my first corporate internship when I was in college Mm -hmm. and I was sitting at a desk, literally could not stay awake. And I was thinking, I am 20 years old and I feel four times this. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe if I have something other than like pizza and champagne, which was my college diet, yeah. maybe I'll have some energy. And yeah. then I started drinking water. Yeah. And I started exercising yeah. and eating vegetables. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, I can stay awake. Yeah. And then it started. Oh, that's why ba- that is where Balanced Black Girl came from I because of that. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God. It was good. <laughs> um, OK, protein. Got it. I would love to talk about fiber because I feel like my prediction is that fiber is going to be the next thing that everybody is going to obsess over after protein. This is. is, Guys, (laughs) not everybody needs all the fibers. And and not immediately if you're used to not eating any. (laughs) This, this. And also, by the way, when you start to increase your fiber, increase your water. Otherwise, you're going to get constipated. You heard it here first. That's the other problem. When people are like, I don't like water. I'm like, you need to grow up. I don't just just drink the water. And don't tell me you drink 60 ounces of water. It's not enough. 96 is the minimum. 96 ounces, guys. Uh, So, okay. Fiber. Yeah, we need to be eating fiber. Men need like 30 grams. Women need like 28 grams. That's great. But a lot of people have a lot of GI disturbances for a multitude of reasons. Food is overly processed. These people like this, like, you know, spend so much time eating like bars and like healthy processed foods, which then overtakes their gut and then they are miserable and it, and it doesn't work out well. So let's try to get it from more whole foods. And again, like I said, you don't need to be getting organic broccoli from, you know, the whole foods. You can go to the dollar store and get broccoli in a bag frozen and you can put it on a pan with a little bit of olive oil and eat that. So like, I'm not suggesting that you, you know, get, get yourself crazy, but you need to increase the fiber. You need to do that slowly and you need to be paying attention because If you don't feel good eating soluble versus insoluble, and the difference is the insoluble fiber creates the bulk stool and the soluble fiber is like the gel that moves it out, right? And so insoluble fiber is like whole grains and soluble fiber is things like chia seeds or like broccoli, for example, right? That's gonna, and then, you know, you you also need water to get it out there, but you gotta pay attention. And so some people do better with less fiber actually, and some people do better with more. But like, don't wake up tomorrow not eating any fiber and then, you know, trying psyllium husk and then all the vegetables and all the seeds and then wonder why your stomach hurts. It's like not a mystery, everyone. And also, everyone, please stop taking the fiber pills. This drives me bananas. Fiber pills. Yeah. People will be like, so I just take these fiber gummies. And I'm like, can you not do that? Can you just eat food? Just eat food. Like, why are you so you don't like berries? Like raspberries have eight grams of fiber. 
68 calories, whole cup. Um, my husband says that raspberries are for rich people. And that's going to be the name of my nutrition book when I write it, actually. <laughs> um, it's going to just like debunk myths. But yeah, like you you can get frozen ones. You can find more fibrous fruits. Pineapple is also a, a good one. I know it is like a little bit higher in sugar, but add some nuts, slow down digestion. You can, you can get it done. But water, watch the fiber, slow and low, my friends. That's good advice. So like, mm-hmm. don't jump both feet in if it's not already a part no, of your diet. No, and none of you get enough fiber. So stop, <laughs> stop all of you. And stop with like the fiber cereals. Those have trash in them. Interesting. Why is it just like, just not you know, fiber? They ha- well, the fiber that they have is chicory and inulin. Okay. Which there's nothing wrong with that because where are you going to get 20 grams of fiber in half a cup of cereal if right. you don't put something into it, right? Yeah. So like that makes sense. But again, that causes a lot of GI disturbance. So you're not going to get be okay with, oh, I'm going to have a cup of this cereal that has 20 grams of fiber and be like, oh, I'm totally fine. Your stomach is going to be super bloated, probably going to be gassy and crampy. Like, don't do that. So please just start with food. And it's better to like moderate our fiber throughout the day instead of like front loading 45 grams all at once. It's not going to work. Your body can only deal with so much. So just like, it's okay. Build up to it. You'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it. Everybody wants instant gratification. I know. Me too. Sam. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm still learning. I know. I have no judgment up here. <laughs> so you did just talk a little bit about GI issues. And I'd love to talk about that too, because it seems like everybody has hot girl stomach issues right yeah. now. What are common GI disturbances and why does it feel like there's an uptick in people complaining about stomach issues? Less because they're all drinking too much alcohol. They're all eating fake shit. And none of them are drinking <laughs> water. And then they'll end and they're starving themselves. And then they go out with their friend one night and they eat everything. They eat all this bread, all this stuff. And then they're like, there's something wrong with me. And I'm like, no, what's wrong with you is that you are like following all this bullshit trends, you're intermittent fasting, you're keto, you're this. Stop, stop, stop doing all the things at once. You don't have to do it all at once. Everybody is in their own lane doing their own thing. What works for Susie down the block doesn't work for Mary down the block. And also Susie's probably lying. She's probably very unhappy. You don't see what's going on in her house behind her closed doors. Always remember that. So I don't know that uh, it's actually that, you know, like, oh, something is happening in the ecosystem per se. It's just that like so many bars, so many fiber powders, so many, and like everyone's, I need more protein. So I need all this fiber powder. Well, like also you're allergic to milk and you're using whey. And so like, that's why your stomach hurts. There's like all these little things that we just like tweak. And then people are like, oh yeah, I can just eat right. Like real food, less processed. There's nothing wrong. Nothing wrong with a bar. There's nothing wrong with a protein powder, but it's not like we don't need to like lead from there. Like get something else and your stomach's not going to hurt as much and stop starving yourselves. Stop it. (laughs) Then your stomach won't hurt. That's real. I had an experience probably about 10 years ago when I was at the height of my fit girly Mm -hmm. life and didn't have the best relationship with food at the time. And I'm grateful to be in a much more balanced, no pun intended place. But at that time, I definitely wasn't eating enough, which I could recognize. I was working out maybe twice a day. I was eating a ton of like brown rice protein powder, which I learned my stomach just doesn't like right. concentrated rice in that yeah. like frequency. Yeah. Yeah. It was too much for my stomach. And I was just like bloated all the time, mm-hmm. never felt great. And then I cut out a lot of that and started eating a little bit more Yeah, and also relaxed a little bit. Cause I do think stress is a big part totally. of it. And like, then felt was, so much better. Then it was fine. Yeah, yeah. That's the other things that people spend the first part of the day, like not eating and trying to be like really, really strict. And you're like, OK, fine. And it's easy to do. Right. Because you have like work, school, you're busy. So you're not worried about that. And then you get home and you just start eating everything in sight. And then it's eight o'clock and you've had like four thousand calories because you stood in front of your cabinet because you didn't eat all day. And now your stomach hurts. And you just keep doing that over and over again. Oh, and by the way, you ate a lot of sugar before you went to bed. So you didn't have a good restful sleep because your body was processing it. And then you woke you up at two o'clock in the morning. And here we go up and down, up and down, up and down. And that is where the problems lie. So call a registered dietitian. 
We take insurance yes. and we will help you. <laughs> yes. And another nutrition kind of myth trend that I would also love to talk about mm-hmm. is blood sugar. That's another thing that a lot of people are talking about yeah. is managing blood sugar. Does the average person who is not diabetic or pre-diabetic or at risk of diabetes need to be tracking that closely? What are your thoughts on that? Again, it goes back to the data, right? Like it's super helpful to know if you everyone in your family is diabetic and like everyone or pre-diabetic, right? So like maybe- That's I my would, family. Yeah. Is diabetic. Maybe I would wear a CGM to see how I clear the carbohydrates because I'm out of curiosity, mm-hmm. do I do okay with complex carbs? How long does it take me to clear processed carbs? Just so that I would then be aware because as I age, things are going to change and I might not be so good at doing that. But like the regular person who has a CGM and they're like- Oh, I ate a cookie and my blood sugar went up. You're like, yeah, that's what it's supposed to do. I don't, I don't care what happens in the exact moment. I care what's happening two hours later. And so did you need that? Probably not. Right. And so, I mean, it's also like super elitist, right? Because insurance isn't going to pay for that unless you have some sort of blood sugar dysregulation. So it's harder for the regular person to be able to afford that where like somebody who who has means can just pay the money every single month and see whatever. I don't know that that data is particularly helpful for the average individual. It's just like another, you know, it's like it's like the watch and this and that. It, it gets you like very addicted to tracking everything. And if you don't have somebody on the other end helping you make sense of it, that then it's just information and then you're not, what are you doing with it? Does it, is it really necessary? We'll right. See. But I mean, the, I think the thing though too, is that I wouldn't even, I wouldn't start there though, unless like you're saying everyone in my family is diabetic yeah. or pre-diabetic, even like my sister has pre-diabetes and like she's young. Then I'd be like, okay, then this is probably beneficial for you. We should do that. Um, but just like hanging around, like, I don't know. I wouldn't, it's not like, oh, my patient's in a larger body. Like you should get a CGM. Like all your, all your labs good. Yeah. Great. Then you don't need one. <laughs> it's like, save your money and let's go, let's focus on something else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And not stress ourselves out about it. Cause yes. that's not helpful. No, there's a lot to stress out about Yeah, baseline. So. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I would also love to talk about GLP-1 medications. If people who may not be familiar with the term GLP-1, uh, that's a class of medications some popular brands are like Ozempic. We go via, I feel like everybody just calls it Ozempic. Although mm-hmm. Ozempic is just like one brand yeah. that is popularized. It was designed to be a diabetes yeah. medication. It is becoming more and more popular for weight loss. Yep. And I think some ways that people talk about it are as if it's like lose weight quick shot. You just take the shot and immediately you lose all this weight instantly. That's not really how it works. No. Uh, Maybe if you're 600 pounds and you're five foot three and you are unhappy, I don't, your labs are great. Everything is fine. But you are unhappy in that body. Then you should go get it. Insurance is going to pay for it. You're going to be happier. Do it. If you are postmenopausal and you've gained 25 pounds and you can't lose it and you are hyper focused on every single thing that you're eating and you're bordering on disordered eating because you are just so upset that this is happening to you and you have all this brain fog and you are just hot flashes and irritable and then this on top of it is fucking with you, go get Ozempic. Go get it. And work with a dietitian who's going to help you manage the symptoms because these drugs delay gastric emptying. So that's going to make your stomach hurt and make you nauseous and make you constipated. And so you need to track what you're eating alongside somebody with with the symptoms so we can manage the symptoms and help to change what you're eating so that you have longevity on the drug and you have better outcomes. There is no shame in taking these drugs. Hard stop. Mm -hmm. If you think you just want to lose five pounds, then you don't you don't need Ozempic, <laughs> guys. <laughs> yes. Like you probably can just like just drink more water and like you know, don't drink three nights a week. Just drink two nights a week. It's probably going to be like fine. But like, mm-hmm. I, so when people come to me and they're just like, I don't like the way that I look, and I want to, and I would feel better 
if I lost some weight? Can you help me lose weight? Sure. I have to like go through the questions and make sure like you don't have this disordered relationship with food. You don't. Okay, check the box. Great. People who are like, hey, I don't like the way that I look and I want to go go on Ozempic. That doesn't mean they have any any disordered anything. They just feel unhappy with the way that they look and they would feel better with less weight on them. There's value there. Interesting. Right? Like you can just, if this makes you happy, it's okay. Just work with the professional so you're not, because I know people that have gone on Ozempic that didn't need to go on Ozempic, right? And they couldn't tolerate it. And then they got off the Ozempic and then they gained the weight they lost plus because you need to be monitored. That's right. the thing. There's no quick fix. Yeah. If there was a quick fix, we'd all be doing the quick fix. There's nothing quick. So you're going to need help. And when someone is taking those medications, well, I guess this is a two-part question. One, do their nutritional needs change when they're on it? No, they, they just become less interested in food. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So is it harder to get the calories they need then? Sometimes. I've had patients that, like I, I had this one patient uh, he and his wife, I love them so much. They're like basically have become family. He's a diabetic and I helped him lose like 50 pounds. It was all great. He's like, yeah, this is great. This, I'm going to see my daughters walk down the aisle. I'm going to walk down the aisle. This is very good. But his metabolism is like super, super slow. And the doctor was like, yo, this guy's just like got to get on Munjaro. And like, I'm coordinating with the doctor. He's like, cause he, I want him to lose like more. I want the A1C to go down. And we, we can see the correlation with the reduction in the lab values to the weight. And he's like, Vanessa, I am, it is so difficult for me to eat. So I would have to force him. Like, so I would set a timer on my phone and then I would send him a note and be like, you need to eat now. And then like the wife would pack the snacks and all the things and he was eating. But he said it was really tough because he was just like not into it at all. But it worked. He lost, he lost the way he got himself into like normal range. And that's where he lives now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And when people do take medications like this to help them lose weight, is it something they have to take forever? Are they able to wean off? So obesity is a chronic disease. Okay. So if you have a chronic illness, you probably take medication for the duration of your life. Mm -hmm. So we would titrate that medicine up and down. We'd probably be on it forever. Okay. And medically, what is the difference between obesity as a chronic disease and having a larger body? Yeah. So if you are obese, you have a set of comorbidities with it, right? Like you could, you have, I don't know, you have diabetes, you have elevated LDL, you have all, like all of these things. And you don't necessarily need to be obese to have diabetes or right. elevated LDL or any of those mm-hmm. things, right? But being being in this is where this is where the BMI thing it's nuanced, but it can help us sometimes, right? Like we say, like okay, this person technically fits into this obesity category, and they have these comorbidities, and they're not doing that great. So this is where it all works out, right? Whereas like somebody's like in a larger body, but everything is fine. All your labs are fine. You move fine. You exercise. You run marathons. Like, you good. You know? <laughs> but also, if you're in a larger body and you want, you don't want to be anymore, that's fine. Just like you're in a larger body and you like it there, that's fine too. I, I used to work for a physician. And the reason why I had stopped working for her, because she would send patients into my office who were in larger bodies and had higher BMIs and the patient was sitting in front of me, but their labs were great. And I would be like, wait, why are you here? Right. Because just because the person was in a larger body, right. d- to me, that doesn't mean anything. Mm-hmm. So I would be like, why are you here? And they'd be like, I don't know. And then I would go to the doctor and they'd be like, well, their BMI is blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, but this person is fine and they don't want to talk to me. So- this is, and I would, I educated the physician, like, do not send these people here. You can ask them if they want a nutrition consult, because that's something that we provide here in this office. And that's perfectly fine. And someone can just talk to me about meal ideas and whatever. Well, you can have all kinds of conversations, but don't just assume that's just because someone's in a larger body that they're unhappy. Exactly. Because they're not. Yeah. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate just talking through that distinction. Yeah. I do think sometimes they're treated as if it's synonymous and it's not. It's not. It's not. But saying that it's not a chronic disease is not actually that's not that's not fair either. Right. Like it, there's a line here where people will be like, it's not a chronic disease. Don't talk about it like that. It's like, well, yeah, it, it can be. 
it is so like it is for some people so let them be able to access whatever they need in order to get a better outcome don't just shut it down and dismiss it because that's not true either. That's why like nutrition and wellness, all stuff, there's all these little nuances and caveats that we just can't ignore. Right. Right. And I think that is why personalized care matters a lot mm -hmm. because I feel like the more that I learn, the more that I'm like general nutrition outside of like be hydrated, yeah. eat plants. Yeah. That's about as like general as Correct. everything else Correct. is so specific Correct. to the person Correct. and to where the person is at in their lifespan. That's which right. Is something that I'm thinking about, like as I'm getting later in my 30s, okay, what worked for me at 25 is a little bit different at 35 where I'm like thinking about perimenopause and yep. where I'm at. And that's just not the same thing, even though I'm the same person. Right. There's always nuance. Yeah. There's so much nuance and everybody has to be careful and like don't place what you think on other people. And also everyone's talking about personalized nutrition, but they actually aren't doing it and they don't know how to do it. I think something that's exciting about Kalina is that for the last four years, we've basically been running a randomized control trial because we have been tracking all the data points and protocols and layering the personalization on top of it when how we treat our patients. And so soon we will be able to say, you have these patients that present in this way, you treat them in this way because it's right here. And and also part of that is because we have diverse patients and we have a diverse team. So 98% of registered dietitians are white women. That's not what our team looks like. Our team is 42% white women. So we've done a very good job of diversifying the pool of people that work for us. And then that makes people want to come into the funnel and, and, all, and, and work with us, which is good. Mm-hmm. I love that you have such a diverse team of dietitians. Yeah. I'm also curious because I, I have heard that number before that such an overwhelming majority of dietitians are white women. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why do you think that is? I have thoughts. But. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it takes five years now to be a dietitian. You must have a master's degree, but in anything, which makes no sense, before you can even sit for the exam. What other profession makes you sit for an exam before you can go work? A doctor or a lawyer? Dietitians make in New York City, make $31 an hour. We pay our dietitians way more than that, but that's what they make. So you're never going to even recoup that. So if you have aptitude for science and you're someone of color, why would you be a dietitian? Well, you would go be a doctor or a PA or a nurse, have autonomy and make six figures off the bat. The, our profession doesn't protect our license. They take money from food companies, they make their money on people failing the exam. They have never done the job of tracking the data to show that what the dietitian does actually reduces the total cost of care. So literally Kalina Health is doing that so that we can also elevate the profession of nutrition yeah. and so that dietitians can get paid a fair and equitable wage. Yeah. You're changing the entire profession. A hundred percent. And so like so necessary. Yeah. And so it's funny because uh, Inc. named me uh, like top female founder or whatever. And I was like, guys, I am underrepresented in like the VC world in my profession. <laughs> like it's just like we are. But really what we're just trying to do is give people access and make people see value in being an RD. It's kind of hard. It is. It's hard, <laughs> but it's really worthwhile. Yeah, it feels good when you talk to people and they're like, oh, you changed my life. Or like the other day, this girl messaged me and was like, you helped me so much five years ago and now I'm pregnant and I'm freaking out and I just need to talk to you and I'll pay whatever. And I was like, it's fine. Just like get on a Zoom with me and I'll talk to you. I didn't remember her because I've talked to you talked to so many people. so many people <laughs> and she was like, you changed my life. You've made things better. I am really healthy and I feel really good. And I and now I'm pregnant and like everything is going by the wayside. And I was like, wow, I helped this person so much. She really believes in the power of nutrition that she the only person she could seek out was me. It was like, please level set me. I was like, girl, you're doing the best you can. Just get just have your baby. Call me when you're done. You're OK. She was like, OK, thank you for saying that. I felt like so nervous that I wasn't doing all the right things. But that makes you feel good. Or when my my client who's like, hey, I'm going to see my daughter. I'm going to walk my daughters down the aisle. I'm not going to have some sort of diabetic related thing. I'm going to be OK because you help me. That makes you feel good. 
because that's, that's the only reason you're doing it. And I think that's the difference about people at Kulina, the Daugherty's at Kulina. Nobody is trying to be famous. No one's trying to be on TV. We're not, none of us are doing that. We don't care. Like, yes, we're on TV because that brings people into the funnel, that, that creates awareness. We're just trying to give people access and get people healthier. Heart stop. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Which is amazing. Yeah. Feels good. So for our audience, if they're interested in working with Kalina in meeting with a dietitian, how can they do that? Go to KalinaHealth.com. There's a direct to initial. You can come into the funnel. We will check your benefits. We will tell you what your benefits are. If for some weird reason you don't have benefits, uh, we do have membership models that are very affordable. Uh, And if you reference uh, this podcast, I will make sure they give you 50% off if you are going to come into the membership. So, yeah. So they can just say, heard about Kalina from Balanced Black. Girl. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So if the benefits, if they're not covered and I'll just send that to the team. Okay. <laughs> I feel like, okay. Me. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Okay. I'll put that in the yeah, show notes that so that people notes. know. Cool. Vanessa, thank you so much for joining Thanks me today. Thanks for having me. It was so good. I will see you soon. And thank y'all for tuning in. So definitely make sure you check out Kalina Health. We will have all of their information in the show notes so that you can sign up to meet with a dietitian and get the nutrition support that you need. Thanks again for tuning in. Please make sure you are subscribed to this podcast if you have not done so already. Apple, Spotify, YouTube so that you never miss an episode and I will see you next time.